We now turn our attention to the role of taxes by recalling the words of Benjamin Franklin that is credited to have said that in this world nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Looking at government revenue in the Eurozone between 1999 and 2014, it hovered around 45% of total GDP, with about 20% being collected at the central government level and the remaining 50% at the state and local government level. Taxes are levied on different forms of economic activity. The largest part of revenues come from net social contributions, which have fluctuated between 35 and 40% of total tax revenues. Next come taxes on production and imports and taxes on income and wealth, between 30 and 35%, and capital taxes revenues being residual in the total amount of tax revenues when compared to the other three tax classes here described. Taxes fall on all forms of income, but other taxes are based on expenditures, such as sales and excise taxes and custom duties. Taxes on labor income typically are progressive. That is, the tax rate on an additional unit of income typically rises with income. In the UK, the maximum tax rate decreased a lot since the late 70s, when it reached over 80%. By 2015, it had decreased almost by half, to about 45%. Looking more closely at the UK income tax structure in 2015, individuals that earned up to £10,600 per year paid 0% of income tax. Then, for every additional pound on top of that amount, the individual paid 20%, what we call the marginal tax rate on that bracket. The next bracket is for income exceeding £42,385, on which the marginal tax rate becomes 40%. The last income tax rate was for income exceeding £160,600, paying a marginal tax rate of 45%. This structure makes average tax rates, that is, the total amount of taxes as a percentage of total gross income, also increasing, as shown in this table. We now turn again to our equilibrium business cycle model to anticipate what the effects of taxes on labor earnings may be. Remember the household budget constraint from before. And let tau w be the marginal tax rate on labor income. A higher tau w will generate more tax revenue for the government, unless the amount of labor income falls sharply. The after-tax real wage rate is then given by 1 minus tau w times w over p, the real wage. If the marginal tax rate tau w rises for a given real wage, the after-tax real wage rate will fall. And our assumption that leisure is a normal good, if the price falls, its opportunity cost, which now is the real after-tax wage, the equilibrium quantity rises, which implies an increase in leisure and a fall in labor supply and consumption. Recalling the government budget constraint, if we are holding government expenditures fixed, the net transfers, that is, transfers received minus taxes paid, must also be fixed. Any change in tax revenue is rebated to households, and thus, no income effects are observed. Therefore, only the substitution effect between leisure and consumption of the increase in the marginal tax rate takes place, leading to a fall in labor supply for the same before tax wage rate. This contraction in the labor supply schedule leads to a contraction in the quantity of labor supplied in equilibrium and to an increase in the before-tax equilibrium real wage rate. Note also that the change in tax revenues from an increase in the marginal labor income tax rate will depend on how much labor supply will fall in response to that tax increase. If the tax rate is zero, then it's obvious that tax revenues are zero. But if the tax rate is 100%, it's also reasonable to assume that there are no incentives to work, as all income is taxed, and therefore no tax revenue will be generated either. Somewhere between these two extreme cases, there's an interval over which tax revenue is positive, and the tax rate where tax revenue is maximized, in tau w star. This relationship between tax revenues and tax rates was popularized by Arthur Laffer, and named after this American economist. Many discussions took place throughout history between economists and politicians precisely regarding on whether an economy at a given point in time 
is to the left or to the right of the revenue maximizing tax rate. The reason for this is that when above that point, a decrease in tax rates is a win-win. Decreases the tax burden and increases tax revenues. This was claimed by the Thatcher government and Reagan administration, and also more recently by the Trump administration, for which he had the public support of Leffer himself, in a book co-authored with Stephen Moore. However, this is a very contentious issue. And when Laffer provided that support, Gregory Mankiw, Harvard professor, was on record saying that the authors do not build their analysis on the foundation of professional consensus or serious studies from peer-reviewed journals. The Laffer curve is undeniable a matter of economic theory. There is certainly some level of taxation at which cutting the tax rates would be win-win. But few economists believe that tax rates in the United States have reached such heights in recent years. To the contrary, they are likely below the revenue maximizing level. Irrespectively of the impact on total tax revenues, our framework predicts a fall in the quantity of labor supply. And this effect will spill over to the market for capital services, that because of the reduction in labor, will now suffer a reduction in the marginal product of capital. Both these effects will result in the reduction of overall economic activity in terms of output. What about taxes on asset income? In terms of the intertemporal substitution effect, it is the after-tax real interest rate that matters. If the tax rate on asset income rises, the after-tax real return on assets declines, and households will have less incentives to defer consumption. Consumption today increases versus consumption tomorrow and savings and investment decrease. The no-arbitrage condition still holds, equating after-tax returns between bonds and capital holdings. What if we are out to increase government spending financed by an increase in labor income taxes? So far, our analysis focused only on increases in government expenditures financed by lump sum taxes. In that framework, we found that consumption would fall one-to-one -one with a permanent increase in government expenditures, leaving aggregate demand, output, wage rate, the rental price, and interest rate unchanged. However, we will get different results if the financing instrument is a distortionary tax, and in the case of a tax on labor income, if labor supply changes. An increase in one unit of government purchases will require net transfers to decrease by one unit also, such that the government budget constraint still holds. Households are now, therefore, effectively poorer. There is a negative income effect inducing higher labor supply. Since the substitution effect points towards a decrease in labor supply, the overall effect is ambiguous. Empirically, the overall effect from permanently increased government purchases, G, on the quantity of labor supplied seems to be small. Suppose now that the government wants to increase net transfers to households by collecting additional revenues on labor income. In this case, the marginal income tax rates rise for two reasons. First, the raise in tax revenue must be financed by higher tax rates if the economy is on the left side of the maximizing tax revenue rate. Second, for households that are net recipients of transfers, such as poor welfare recipients, the expansion of the transfer program raises the implicit marginal income tax rate, because typically such transfers are means-tested. This means they depend on the level of income. So the progressivity of the tax and transfer structure make it so that poor households get a higher marginal tax rate, thus inducing stronger effects on labor supply and consequently also on the demand for capital services and overall economic activity.